Well, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for connecting with us online. My name's Nathan. If I haven't met you yet, great to have you today. And I pray that uh, you've already encountered the Holy Spirit through worship, um, through prayer, and hopefully through this message as well. So I'm, I'm going to jump right into our message today that's part of our Standing on Snakes summer series. You know, what, what a series for the summer, hey? Like, <laughs> like for real, Standing on Snakes. You, you know, the tendency is when summer kind of rolls around, the weather gets good, um, we tend to disengage a little bit. And that's just kind of how it goes in the summer. And with restrictions, with COVID getting lighter now, it's, it's really easy to just kind of say, yeah, I'll be back in September. You know, most people say that to mean that they're going to be back gathering uh, in the corporate body again in September. But <clears throat> how many of us have subconsciously, you know, done that in our minds or in our hearts as well? This summer series, Standing on Snakes, is, is actually meant to keep us engaged, to remind us that the kingdom is always advancing, always, that there's no such thing as, as time off uh, in the kingdom. There, there's no such thing as I'm disengaging for a little while from kingdom activity or, or from advance. Um, so whether you gather in the building uh, or whether you gather in your homes with other people or whether you're gathering at the beach or at a campsite with other believers, um, we keep advancing forward. We will advance forward and we keep talking about of people who are overcomers um, in, in, this, in the kingdom, overcomers of our current reality. And we will say no to fear. We will expose fear. We'll say no to fear and, and no to anxieties and worries. And we'll expose the snakes and the mindsets that keep us from moving forward and advancing in the kingdom and the ability to trample on snakes and scorpions. We want the posture that Jesus laid out before us and empowered us with in Luke 10, 19, as you've heard me say multiple times. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing, nothing by shall any means hurt you. So welcome to the series. <laughs> welcome to Standing on Snakes. And the title of today's message, are you ready? The title of today's message is there's protection in the presence. There's protection in the presence of God. Let me say that again. There's divine protection in the presence of God. Say that to your neighbor, whether you're in your home or a campsite, say there's divine protection in his presence. How does it make you feel when, when you hear that or when I say that or when you say it? How, how do you feel? Do you, do you believe that? Perhaps you struggle in believing that there's, there's protection in his presence. Possibly we're all over the spectrum with that. But I want to share this verse with you. This verse from Romans 8 verse 11. This is going to be our theme verse for the day. Romans 8 verse 11 says this. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised uh, Jesus, Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. <laughs> that is so good. This is huge. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, which he does if you're a follower in Christ, that same resurrection power that same resurrection life lives in you. Therefore, there is no need to fear sickness. There is no need to fear torment uh, from the devil. There's no need to fear the enemy in any kind of way. There's no need to fear disease or sickness or virus or COVID. Why? Because in the resurrection, walking in the resurrection presence of God is walking in his resurrection protection of God. See, there's no sickness or disease in his presence. There's none. And you, as a Christ follower, are a carrier of the resurrection presence of God. That's <laughs> so good. You have resurrection life in you. So there's no need to fear sickness. There's no need to fear the torment of the enemy. 
There's protection in the presence of God. He who dwells in the presence of God will find protection. No plague will come near your tent. No evil will befall you. Psalm 91. You have resurrection life inside of you. This is real. This is a powerful truth. So powerful. Let me just take a moment here to remind us, though, of who is actually living inside of us. This is really important. In Luke 6, 17 and following, um, it says that there was a great multitude of people from all over the place who came to gather around Jesus. And it says that they came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they too were healed. And it says the whole multitude sought to just touch him, (laughs) just to touch Jesus for the power that went out from him and healed them all. They just wanted to touch and uh, touch his power, touch his garment. All of them, it says, every single one were healed. Friends, that power that was exhibited there, that power to heal is the same person who lives inside of you, the same one. On another occasion in, um, in John 11, there's one of Jesus' closest friends, Lazarus, who had gotten sick. And to make a long story short, Jesus was in a different town when he heard this news about his friend. And, and yet he decided, you know what? We're gonna stay in this other town for a couple more days. In the meantime, Lazarus died. And then four days later, after Lazarus died, Jesus and his, his disciples showed up uh, to where he had died. You know, and there was mourning, there was weeping, there was lots of commotion. And then in in this crowd, there was there was this murmuring going on, saying, "Hey, you know what? Like this Jesus guy, he he could open the eyes of the blind. Why couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying?" It's an interesting question. So Jesus walks to the tomb, and and the stone was then rolled away to expose the body that had been dead for four days, Lazarus. And then people were saying, oh, Lord, like by this time, his body stinks, okay? There's a stench. And Jesus says, yes, Martha. But I need to expose the fresh air of life to drive out the stench of death. See, didn't I tell you, Martha, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Oh, Oh, man, these these people had no idea what they were about to witness. Now, of course, okay, of course, Jesus could have healed Lazarus before he died, but he waited. And he waited so he could demonstrate that resurrection life and power swallows up death and decay. It's like Jesus was saying, hey, you know what? I I don't want to merely show you that I can heal sickness. I I don't want to merely show you that I can cast out demons. No, no, no. I want to show you that the resurrection is more than just a doctrine, okay? Because they believed in, in the doctrine of resurrection, that one day Lazarus would one day rise again at the end. But Jesus was saying, I want you to see that I am the author of life and death. I want you to see that. I want you to see that I am the resurrection and the life. (laughs) That he who believes in me, though he may die, will live forever. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Wow. So with the stench of death coming out of the tomb, the voice of resurrection power, the voice of resurrection life called out to the dead body. Lazarus, Come out. And it says, it says right there, then in front of everybody, Lazarus, who had died four days earlier, slowly hobbled out. Could you imagine the scene? Okay, he's mummified. He's, he's like hobbling. He still had grave clothes tightly wrapped around his hands and feet and covering his face. And then Jesus says, church, or to those around, but he would say to the church, take off his grave clothes and let him loose. Friends, Nothing can stay dead in the presence of resurrection life. Did you hear that? Nothing can stay dead in the presence of resurrection life. It's true. Nothing can stay dead in the presence of resurrection life. 
And the spirit of that same voice who spoke to death and said, arise. The resurrection life, resurrection power lives in you. Oh, it's in the words of, of that elevation song, Rattle, that says, my God is able to save and deliver and heal and, and restore anything that he wants to. Just ask the man who's thrown on the bones of Elisha if there's anything he cannot do. <laughs> in 2 Kings 13, that's where it's quoted from. There was a man who had died and his friends threw him into the tomb of Elisha. And the corpse, check this out, the corpse landed on the bones of Elisha. And as soon as the dead man's body touched the bones of Elisha, resurrection life was blown into the dead body and he was raised to life. <gasps> that same spirit that was upon Elisha, that same resurrection power that was on Elisha lives in you. Let that land. See, the Bible paints a picture that resurrection power of Jesus Christ breathes life and power and healing and protection into the lives of people and swallows up death and decay and sickness and disease. That's what the Bible teaches. Take a look at your life right now. Right now, just take a look at your life and look into the areas where you are seeing decay and, and sickness and disease and unhealth and death and turn toward it right now and declare resurrection life into your mortal body. Do it right now. Declare resurrection life into your mortal body. If you're walking in resurrection presence of Jesus, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing that you can't overcome. There's nothing that cannot be defeated. See, the question in all of this is, am I walking in his presence where I can experience this level of protection from fear, from, from torment, from sickness and plagues and diseases? And you know what? The immediate answer most of us would say is, of course, of course I'm walking in his presence. He lives inside of me and he, he's always with me. That's awesome. Great. Let's take that to the next level. Let's take that to the next level. What, what does it look like to, for you to be someone who not only acknowledges that you are a Christ follower and that he's with you, but that you are engaged with the presence of God 24-7? What does that look like? What does it look like to engage in the practice of the presence of God in your life where you are cognitively aware uh, of his presence all the time? And you're encountering his manifest presence on a regular basis. What does that look like? See, the foundational perspective of living the life of, Christ, of a Christ follower does not start from the reality in which we, we can see and tangibly touch. It doesn't start here. It starts in heavenly places. Ephesians 2.6, we are created to live heaven down, not, not earth upward. Walking in his presence means you think like heaven. You, you learn to think like heaven. You, you act like heaven. And, 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 you, and everything you do has a starting point of sitting on the throne room in the heavenly places. So let the things from above always be on your mind and, and your lips. Abiding in him, in his presence, means never leaving. It means never leaving. It, it means being a permanent resident. And you don't want to leave. You just you, you want to stick around. It not, only, it not only means spending time in the quiet place of your day, you know, resting and soaking and listening to worship music and reading and journaling, but it also means he's always on your mind and your heart. You know, you're consciously carrying him everywhere you go. You know, when I, when I go into a conversation, I'm always processing in my spirit, how does, how does heaven think about this? What, what does heaven want to do? What does heaven want to say? What is the kingdom up to in this situation? Walking in his presence means you're a heavenly throne room dweller, not an earthly throne room visitor. So this next level of faith believes that there really is protection in his presence, that there's no disease in his presence, that because I have resurrection power and resurrection life living inside of me, I therefore fear nothing. I therefore worry about nothing. I am protected from sickness. I am protected from disease because I'm habitually walking in his presence. 
here's the issue. Many of our personal experiences or the personal experiences of others do not line up with what we see in Scripture. I understand that. I, I can see that. But let me say this. Just because your experience does not line up with what God promises does not change who he is. Just because your experience does not line up with the promises of God does not mean that he's not your healer. It, it does not mean that God does not protect you. You know, who, who said that God does not heal like he did in the Bible? Who, who said that, that God does not uh, protect you in supernatural ways like he did in the Bible? Does experience say that to you? Does logic or uh, friends or the news, maybe theologians, certain theologians or scholars... Don't let people's lack of experience in the healing touch of Jesus or in his protection diminish your faith level and who he says he is. You know, I can, I can hear the enemy cackle like a wicked witch whenever I see prayer requests come in to me or to the, to the church about, you know, prayer for physical injuries or, or issues with their bodies or, or I hear about them in the news. Because the enemy loves to use cancer and illness and diseases and, and broken bodies that are not yet healed to try to prove that God is not our protector, not our healer. And the problem is that many of people use the, the same things as ammunition to say that God does not protect them or that God does not heal them. We, we need to stop thinking like that. We, we need to not go there. It's a slippery slope. It's a slippery place to be. See, there's a strange phenomenon out, out there right now that's, that's been recently birthed. It's called cancel culture. I'm sure you've heard of it, which is the popular practice of withdrawing support for canceling public figures or companies after they've done or said something considerable, considered rather object, objectionable or offensive. It's generally discussed as being performed on social media in the form of group shaming. I would say that not everything about cancel culture is good. But let me say this about God. Do not let your current reality cancel out God as your healer. Do not let your current reality cancel out God as your protector. There's something I like to call uh, holy tension in the scriptures, in the Bible. If, if, you know, it's like this. If God is my healer, like he says he is, why then am I still sick? You know, if, if God is our protector, why did my mom and dad die in that motorcycle crash? If God really is my protector, then why, why is this seemingly bad stuff happening to me? Why did it happen? If, if there really is resurrection life, as the Bible says, in my body, and he gives life to my mortal body, why do I still have scoliosis? Uh, why do I still uh, have this disease? Why am I still in a wheelchair? Good questions. You know, we might, one of you might be right in the middle of this tension right now. Maybe you're just saying, I just don't get it. I don't understand. It's so hard to understand. Friends, I, I want to tell you, I get this more than you know. I really understand this. And I have learned that I don't have to understand. It's a hard place to go to. I, I don't have to understand. I, I, it's not necessary anymore for me to have to have the answers. And I've practiced releasing that tension to Jesus and just trusting him that, and still believing and declaring the truth that he is still my healer, that he's still my protector, and he is still good. Maybe some of you are asking the question right now, yeah, Nathan, have you ever struggled with his tension? Um, does this happen to you? Yes, it happens to me too. You bet it does. I was in an accident with uh, one of my daughters, Carmela, on December 2nd, 2019. We were traveling back from 
somewhere in BC and the snow was partially covered, uh, had partially covered the highway and I hit a patch of black ice and I spun around and around multiple times and at 70 kilometers an hour, bam, we hit a concrete barrier right in the middle of the, of the road, the, the center median. Airbags went off, fluid flying everywhere, smoke coming out of the dash. It was crazy. The truck was a complete Right off. 70 kilometers an hour, straight into the concrete barrier. Later on that day, Carmel and I and my wife Sandra went to the urgent care just to get checked out, you know, and make sure everything's okay. We were feeling pretty good. And we told the doctors that, and they actually said, yeah, just wait. This is adrenaline you're feeling. You're feeling adrenaline. You feel great. And just wait for tomorrow. You're going to feel like 100 times worse. <laughs> Thanks a lot. But Carmel and I are like, no way, that's not happening. We started to declare the opposite, that we would actually feel better. I want to tell you that that next day, we felt 100%. We felt 100%. There was no, there was no pain. There was no, uh, we experienced no kind of pain or soreness other than that minor soreness that we had the initial, the initial, during the initial accident. That's it. That's supernatural protection. Supernatural protection. And some would say, yeah, you know what? You were still in an accident. How is that protection? And I'm like, settle down just a minute. I would say, I actually saw an angel standing between our vehicle and the concrete barrier absorbing the majority of that blow. <gasps> I did. I saw that angel. It should have been much worse than it really was. Supernatural protection. Thank you, Lord. So what is the best way for you and I to respond in this tension? You know, um, there's, there's supernatural protection. There is supernatural healing, but I don't experience it. I don't see it. What is the best way for you and I to respond? The Bible says that it's true. How do we raise, uh, raise up or increase our level of faith when we haven't experienced it yet? What is the kingdom way to think through this if I'm currently experiencing affliction or, uh, or suffering or cancer or illness or disease or any issue in my body that has not yet been healed? The answer actually is not, well, God afflicted me to teach me a lesson. That is not the answer. God's not the author of sickness. You may be sick, but, and you may be learning things through it, but he did not afflict you. See, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 talked about the thorn in his flesh. It was a messenger from Satan, it says, that the Lord actually never released Paul from, and yet, check this out, and yet, in the last book that Paul wrote, our theme verse for the day, Romans 8, 11, he still declared that resurrection life had power to heal and breathe life into your mortal bodies, <laughs> even though he had not yet experienced it fully in his own life. That's powerful. Eric Johnson, uh, he's a senior pastor at Bethel Church in Reading. He has a hearing impediment, and I think he's had it since birth, if I'm not mistaken. He's prayed and asked for healing thousands of times and had people pray over him more times than I can count, for healing for his ears. He has not yet been healed, but it has not deterred him from praying for healing for others. And God has healed multiple people through him for ear issues. That's amazing. And he keeps saying, Jesus is good. Jesus is my healer. My time is still coming, and in the meantime, I will keep praying, and I will keep declaring healing over other people and claiming their testimony over my life. It's the same for you and I. There is this holy tension, you know, but, but you and I must rise above this tension and declare and believe the truth about who God is. We need to begin making decisions based on, on the faith of God, not the fear of demons. We must rise above that tension and realize that, that because we walk with resurrection power and life, we walk in supernatural protection. There is no reason to fear sickness. There's no reason to think that gathering together as a church is dangerous when the opposite is what is true. 
that not gathering as a body of believers is what is dangerous. We must come to a place of faith that believes there is protection in the presence of God. There is protection in the presence of God. Let me just finish up here by way of plugging a book. Uh, It's a tool for you. It's been fantastic for my life and for many others in, in learning to practice walking in the presence of God. You know, he's our protector as you walk in our presence. It's this book called Practice of the Presence of God. It's by Brother Lawrence. He was a seventh century monk. Fantastic, fantastic book. Um, So important, I want to end on this note. I encourage you to get it, buy it, read it, and learn to practice walking in the presence of God. You know, it's, it's, the goal is not to just encounter the presence of God once a week on a Sunday. No, no, no. But anywhere and anytime and in any place, you can encounter his presence. You can walk in his presence 24-7. And it's in his presence where we have the greatest protection. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that in Christ, we have resurrection power. I thank you, Lord, that your spirit is alive in us and we can experience resurrection life and healing and power through our mortal bodies. We praise that you are our protector, that you are our healer. And Lord, in the middle of this tension that we may be experiencing, help us to rise above that tension and speak speak faith, by faith what we cannot yet see. So I, I, I want to just speak healing over those who have not yet experienced healing. I want to declare protection over those who feel they're not protected. Lord, protect them. Let them run after you. Let them know what it means to walk and cultivate uh, walking in your presence. Lord, I thank you for them. Fill them with faith. Fill them from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet with your spirit. Bless them this week. Fill them as they go. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.